Well, our air conditioning went out at home. That's how you tell that story, right, Lois? We always tell, we always uh, kid my brother who tells stories like they're going to be really bad. And then right at the end, it wasn't bad at all, but at the whole time, you're, oh, no, it's too bad. Yeah, so we called Jeff Janulus, or Janulius if you want to pronounce his name wrong. It's Janulus, and he came and fixed it in about two hours. And he says hello to all of you. Happy story. So, so we're cool. <laughs> Not a good joke at all. So, a sermon type, dogs of faith. What in the world is this guy? Just out of the blue, right? Um, how many times do you see a headline and then you read the story and the story doesn't say what the headline leads you to believe or you have to go somewhere else to find the rest of the story? Ever happen? All the time. I mean, if you're, if you're looking on your phone and you're scrolling through stories, there's a headline that's supposed to grab you, right? And then you go into the story and it's like, you know, it's, you'll never believe, you know, and then like, well, well, what's so unique about this? So, our passage is in Mark 7, 24 through 30. Jean, 1072. Can you hear me, by the way? All right. But if you talk to me, I may not be able to hear you. So, that's... <laughs> I'm getting a thumbs up for that. So, very little conversational style going on today. Uh, so, and from there he arose and went away to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and did not want anyone to know, yet he could not be hidden. But immediately a woman whose little daughter had an unclean spirit heard of him and came and fell down at his feet. Now the woman was a Gentile, a Syrophoenician at, by birth, and she begged him to cast the demon out of her daughter. And he said to her, Let the children be fed first. For it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she answered him, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs under the table eat the children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this statement you may go your way, and the demon has left your daughter. And she went home and found the child lying in bed, and the demon was gone. That's a crazy story. I've read that story so many times, and every time I've, I've never studied the passage, and I've read this story, and I'm like, oh, that's kind of an embarrassing story. <laughs> Why did they put that in there? So, what would be a good headline for this story? You know, something compelling. And I'm thinking, Jesus calls woman a dog, possible hate crime. <laughs> I'm going to look at that one. Click, click, right? Double click on that. Think in New York Times headline, no doubt. Um, then we find this long account of how misogynist and racist Jesus is. Um, you know, the Times story would have a response from the uh, uh, Syrophoenician um, Civil Liberties Union, something like that. You know, I mean, you'd, you'd have the whole package there. Twitter would just go nuts with that. It's outrageous. It's totally outrageous. But, you know, a lot of that's in there. Can't believe that guy. Why is he so popular if he's going around treating people like that? And then you read the story, and it doesn't exactly play out the way the headline reads, but you, you don't find that out until the last paragraph in the story when it says authorities are investigating whether he may have cast a demon out of the unnamed woman's daughter. You know, it's this, this little thing at the end that's like, oh, 
maybe it wasn't all bad after all. So, here's the story. A woman from the area of Tyre, which is just, if you're wondering, that's Lebanon these days. Uh, she comes to Jesus asking for help, and his response is, it was a little, little off-center. You know, he basically calls her a dog. That's what it sounds like. And, or at least he's comparing her to a dog. See, in Jesus' time, it was common for Jews to call Gentiles dogs. That was, it was really an offensive label. You know, it's not the compliment that it is today. Uh, just a cultural reference there. Kind of a troubling passage if you don't understand the culture of the time or what Jesus' mission was. And then it, it ends up with this, this awesome lesson about great faith. That's the story here. This is a woman with a, a quick mind and a quick wit. She's the kind of woman you want to have as a mom. This would be a great Mother's Day sermon, actually. I was thinking, you know, what a great Mother's Day sermon. Jesus calls a woman a dog. I mean, this, is, this couldn't be better. Um, but this isn't about her. And it's amazing how quickly she took the statement of Jesus and turned it into a profession of faith. So, let's examine four characteristics of great faith. The first one is great faith approaches Jesus boldly. Great faith approaches, approaches Jesus boldly. It's nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> Just... I am hitting on all cylinders today, right? Wow, I should stop right now. Well, Jesus didn't come just to, to work miracles. Uh, he came to redeem the world. It was all about faith. So, again, Jesus is trying to get away for a little break. It seems like every week I have that somewhere in this passage. He's just trying to get away, you know, trying to sneak off with the disciples, and uh, it just doesn't work. There's no secret place for him. It's impossible to keep Jesus a secret. So, this Gentile woman heard about him and ignored all the social barriers. A couple, couple cultural barriers. First, a Gentile would never speak to a Jew. They just wouldn't speak to each other. And the second thing is, a strange woman would never address a man who wasn't a family member. So she was, she was just going all out here. And, but she approached Jesus with humility. She fell at his feet. She begged him. And we see this on occasion. People will fall at Jesus' feet and just hold his sandal and beg him for something. And this was an act of worship. It was an act of, of surrender very vulnerable and she's and she also approaches Jesus with this profession of faith in Matthew's account of this passage and Matthew expands on a little bit more I don't think I've ever mentioned it but Mark Mark is writing to a Roman uh, audience so his the Roman audiences um, are always looking for impact points and action and move quickly and get to the story. And so all of Mark's stories are really quick. You know, it's a very short gospel. And well, why, why, did, why didn't he expand? Well, because his audience was Roman. And this is a, he, he, didn't, he didn't see any of this happen, by the way. You know who saw this happen? He's, he's writing down the reflections in the ministry of Peter. He's one of Peter's disciples. So he's writing down what Peter is saying in sermons and reflections. And so Peter, you know Peter, he's a man of action, right? This is what I do, this is what I did it, this was bad, this was good. And it's all pretty clear. So, short passage, and, and then you go to other... Uh, Gospels who have the same story and they expand on it a little bit more. But it's all about who the audience is. But that's an aside. She, so she approaches Jesus with this profession of faith. And she says, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. 
My daughter is suffering terribly. She was a Gentile woman, yet she understood and she believed Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. She called him son of David, which was a term signifying Jesus was the Messiah. And then here's this daughter who's being tormented by a demon. She didn't ask for herself. She was interceding for a little girl. You know, there's great power in intercession, right? We would believe that in Elam. We, we do a lot of interceding for each other at Elam. So, you know, do we think that's important? Yeah, we definitely do. We pray for each other. That's, that's one of our hallmarks here is we, we pray for each other. Writer of Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us then with confidence draw near. Sometimes I wonder uh, whether God brings us to these points of desperation because you know some of us will only come to him at times of desperation. You know, everything else is like, oh, yeah, we're, we're doing good, we're doing good, yeah, everything's great. And then all of a sudden, you know, a ceiling tile falls in, and we're like, oh, how could this happen? Well, Vance Havner used to say the problem with unanswered prayer is that the situation is desperate, but the saints are not. The situation is desperate, saints, oh, it's all right, it's all right. You know, we're kind of like the, the frog in the, in the cool water, and you're slowly turning up the heat. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. It's boiling, you know, it's a... So, yeah, that's kind of us in a nutshell. So, great faith approaches Jesus boldly. And then great faith doesn't quit when it's insulted. When we get a... What? She, she did everything fine. You know, she approached Jesus correctly. She respected, she worshipped him. She, she's groveling at his feet. And every other time this happened, as we've been going through Mark, you know, Jesus is always kind and gentle and helpful, and, you know, he'll always take time for you, even when there's other pressing needs. <laughs> so, so, you know, when Jesus says, uh, in Matthew's account, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. It wouldn't be proper to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Wouldn't be proper. Or as uh, Bush used to say, it wouldn't be prudent. Yeah. Since she was a Gentile, Jesus was comparing her, uh, her request to what a dog would do at a table. It was a cultural reference. The word he used in Greek is, is in, it's, it's called a diminutive form of the word. I had to look it up. I didn't know that. That, I, that wasn't from my long study of Greek. Um, but it would actually, and I don't understand why they don't do this in the translations, it would actually translate as puppy. So, you know, it's really a comment about, you know, children and puppy. You know, just simple analogy. No reason to get all bent out of shape about this. You know. He doesn't need to be canceled, right? He's, he's, he just, yeah, it's just a reference. But a puppy, you know, it might be cute, but you might, it's still a dog. It's still a dog puppy. You know, it's not another child. It's not a baby. It's a dog. And I think Dave, Dave made this reference last week. You know, when the rabbi would get up in the morning and say, thank God, I thank thee that I was not born a Gentile, a dog, or a woman. You know, she managed to, you know, be two of those, and then he threw in the third one, just... <laughs> but dogs were, you know, nasty. They, 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 Isaiah compared false prophets to dogs. And um, when Paul wrote to the believers at Philippi, he warned them to watch out for dogs as a reference to false teachers. And, you know, if you've ever been to other countries, people kick dogs. Dogs are around there kicking them and stuff. Oh, you know. But they're just, other than here and maybe in England and a few other places, dogs are not creatures that you want to have living in your house with you. 
So, and someone might say, well, I think Jesus was just making an analogy. Well, just a kind of a playful insult, just kind of a little sparring. Kind of like when someone says something really nasty to you, and then they say, just kidding, just kidding. You know, like, and then you're like, really? Were you really just kidding? Or you're just trying to get out of it? Okay, I, was, I guess I was supposed to laugh at that horrible thing you just said about me. Um, but it's still an insult. I don't know. It's still an insult. And I don't really think there's any way to dress it up. So, how do you react? How do you react when you're insulted? I'm not asking. That was rhetorical, fortunately, because I can't hear you anyway, right? So, um, Proverbs 12:16 says, "A fool is quick-tempered, but a wise person stays calm when insulted." And then she she just kind of ignored the insult. She didn't get all bent out of shape. And she continued to trust that Jesus would answer her prayer. You know, we, we, we describe what's going on in these situations. When we say it, you know, when we ask God for something, it's a prayer. We don't think of these as prayers. These are prayers. They're, they're talking directly to Jesus in this case. But they're prayers. They're beseeching him. And there's great power in persistent prayer. You know, are you persistent in your prayers, or, or do you give up quickly? Jesus taught us, knock, and it will be, I'm sorry, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. And those verbs are all continuous action kinds of verbs. Ask, and keep on asking. Seek, and keep on seeking. Knock, and keep on knocking. I had just uh, just been writing that, and and uh, actually, I, I, we've we've lived in our house for almost 35 years, and we don't have a doorbell. Any any of you who've been to our house, like, they don't have a doorbell. What, what can you, you're looking for the doorbell? It's got to be maybe it's under the mailbox. You know, it's there, no, we don't have one. So if we invite you over, don't look, and don't knock once. We won't be coming. You know, if you knock once, you you, you got to. Then there's a chance. Um, but I had just written that, and Jeff showed up at our house. Jeff has a man's knock. <laughs> it was like, yes. <laughs> I don't know. So that happened. But have you been praying for something? lately, uh, for days or weeks or months or years. You know, we've been praying, Lois and I have been praying for something for years. And maybe some of you have been praying for something for years. And there doesn't seem to be any... I don't know. You not hear us? Are you mad at us? You know, you just... I don't think God's mad at me, but I, you know, who knows? But God rewards persistent prayer. God rewards persistent prayer. So approach boldly. Don't give up. Third thing, great faith is content with the crumbs of grace. <laughs> the crumbs of grace. It doesn't even sound good, does it? The crumbs of grace. But Jesus said it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And she agreed with him. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. <laughs> that was kind of a response. Yeah, I get it. Um, but, but even the puppies under the table get the children's crumbs, she says. Basically, that's what she's saying. Like, what a great comeback. I mean, if he says that to me, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to say what I'm thinking, right? You know, I mean, you're like, oh, what a jerk to clean it up a little bit. and But she had this great faith. And she was saying, Lord, I may be a puppy, 
but you're so powerful that I don't need the first serving. Just like the puppies, I'll be happy to feed on the crumbs of your grace. You know, it's a weird thing to say, but that's what she's saying. And that will be enough for you to help my daughter. <laughs> it's incredible faith. Just incredible faith. Great faith, great humility. And I, and I wonder about my, am I easily offended? Do I, you know, do, do my feelings get hurt quickly? Am I always thinking, you know, I deserve better than this. I deserve better than this. You know, after all I've done, <laughs> you know, <laughs> after all I've done, you know, all indignant. And now when it comes to contentment and the grace of God, are you humble enough to be willing to take the crumbs? What does that mean? Or do you think maybe you're too good for the crumbs? Do you only want what you want, or are you willing to take what God gives you? That's, that's what this means. I want it this way, and if I don't get it this way, I don't want it. Really? You mean you wouldn't take relief from your problem by any other means? Just the way you want it? That's what your prayer is? That's how narrow your prayer is? That if you don't, get, if you don't win the publisher's clearinghouse sweepstakes... Well, I've prayed for that for years and I haven't gotten it. Well, you keep praying and that'll be something you can be doing. But that's the point here. The crumbs in this situation are, are this woman's daughter being delivered from being demon-possessed. We, we love to quote this verse from uh, Paul when he was in prison. And he'd much rather be traveling the world, is what, which what his profession was. He was an evangelist and a church planter. That's what he did. And he was spectacular at it. He wrote, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. The secret to this woman's faith was that she wasn't ashamed to beg for the crumbs of grace. When Jesus called her a puppy, I, I, I still, you know, it's, I still read this. Oh, I read it like 50 times, right, this week. But I'm like, are you kidding me? Why would you do that? But when Jesus called her a puppy, she just shrugged it off. It was like, so what? That's, that's not what I'm here about. And she was really humble. It's really such a valuable thing, and it's so, so rare today. It's a lot easier for us to make demands before God than to beg him for mercy like a dog begging for a crumb. Such a, that's such an unpleasant picture. I just, I just, I'm just kind of revulsed at that picture of me begging for a crumb before God. And yet, it's one thing to be bold before the Lord, it's another thing to be demanding. My way. My, I know what's best for me. In 1707, Isaac Watts wrote a great hymn, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. I don't know if any of you uh, know this. Alas, this uh, is the first line. Alas, and did my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die? Would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I? Well, later, the word worm was considered to be too insulting. So it was changed to say, would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? And in some hymnals, even sinner was considered too offensive. And so that's been edited to, would he devote that sacred head for someone such as I? There. Now we're all happy. 
So I'm working on the next edition. Would he devote the sa that sacred head for such a good guy as I? <laughs> there. Yeah. Let's make it upbeat. Let's make the crucifixion about just happy people. But humility is just lost in our culture, where everyone gets a participation trophy. I don't want to make anyone feel a little bit like they're not quite as good as the next person. You know, I, I'm, I'm as good as, hey, LeBron James and I, we're, you know, we're so similar in every aspect. I mean, I could teach him something about basketball. But everybody's a good guy. Everybody's talented. Everybody, you know, it's, it's silly. Who are you to say I'm a sinner? And actually, God says it. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Very simple statement. Nothing obscure there. All have sinned. We're all in the same boat. See, without God's grace, we're lost. We're lost. So approach Jesus boldly. Don't give up. Be humble. And the fourth thing, assume your faith will be tested. Jesus looked at the woman kneeling at his feet and says, you know, again, the same statement. Not right to the, take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. And there's a lot of opinions about this. But I think he was just testing her. This is just a test. In the hardest classes, everything is fair game in a test. The hardest class, speaking of being a Greek student, I had a teacher, Dr. Murray Harris, best teacher I've ever had, taught Greek. So he knew the original language backwards and forwards, and literally he did. But every day after the, after the morning prayer, there was a quiz. And, and, and it was called Crash Greek. We took it in the summer, and you had to have it for seminary. So six days a week, you had four hours of class, and you were supposed to study three hours for every hour you spend in the classroom. 18 hours a day? Are you out of your mind? Well, they did call it Crash Greek for a reason. So he said, you've got to listen to me. You've got to listen to everything I say. And every morning we're going to have a little quiz. It won't be a big test, but just a little quiz just to keep you focused. So first quiz, second day of class, everybody misses the same question. Well, where was that? It was in the opening prayer. You've got to listen. Everything is, uh, anything can be on the test. That's with God. Anything can be on the test. And because Jesus knows all things, I believe he knew she would pass the test. And of course she did. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Great response. And such a great response. And then Jesus' response was, woman, you have great faith. Now, if, if you don't understand the cultural background of that story, you don't get that at all. It's like, where did that come from? That just totally came out of left field. Jesus' response, great faith. Which, I don't even get this. And, she, and he says, your, your request is granted. Three things about faith. Without faith, one, it's impossible to please God. We know that. Second thing, God rewards faith. Third thing, God always, always tests faith. It seems like he was testing the faith of this woman. He made the statement about the puppies. The problem is, we don't always recognize when God is testing us. And most of the time, the tests are disguised as troubles and trials and adversity and things that are coming out of the blue that we have no way to prepare for. And they just come and they hit us, and it's a test. Peter said, these trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. See, how we act, how we act 
determines our reputation, but how we react reveals our character. That shows who we really are when we react to something. And the way this woman reacted to an apparent, uh, to an apparent insult revealed her character. So, are you in the middle of some trial right now? It seems like there's always a trial. There's always some test going on in our lives. Can't be too far from one. I remember when I was, I used to be watching TV late at night, probably when I was supposed to be studying or something, you know. And there would be a minute during the time that would usually be, um, uh, be advertisements, and this voice would come on and say, this is a test of the emergency broadcasting system. Do you, do you remember, remember those? You go to bed early, a lot of you? No? So, the broadcaster of your area and voluntary cooperation of federal and state and local authorities have developed this system to keep you informed in the event of emergency. Okay? And then you'd hear their, you know, and it was like, oh, and it seemed like it went on for five minutes, it was probably five seconds, you know, but it was a steady, blaring sound. And then I would say, this was only a test. This concludes this test of the emergency broadcasting system. So, yeah, these, these tests, but they're not usually announced. By the way, you have a test coming up next week. I mean, that's what they did in school, right? My, my, uh, my aunt was a teacher and then she was a, a school principal. She used to tell me, never worry about a test. It just lets you know where you stand. So I always worried about my tests because I didn't study. And that's a problem. You may not be prepared. So maybe that God is testing your faith. God knows where you stand with Him. God knows where you stand with Him. Maybe you just need to know too. Maybe you just need to know too. That's what a test is. You know? How's the relationship going? Well, let me give you a test, and then we'll know. He's not angry with you. He just needs you to know where you stand. He needs you to know what he knows. Whenever you go through adversity, even if you... Uh, If you listen carefully, you might hear this message. This is a test. This is a test of your faith. This is only a test. Doesn't mean I don't like you. It's just a test. So, are you content to receive the crumbs of grace? It sounds good to me. Martin Luther wrote some, you know, obviously, uh, we all came from Martin Luther. Even if you think, oh, I'm not a Lutheran, well, that's where we came from. He stepped out in faith in a big way and started the ball rolling. And he wrote a lot of deep stuff, but, but as he neared death, his writings became more basic. And he suffered... He suffered for 10 years and finally died when he was 62. So relatively young, I'm thinking, wow, that's really young. You know, 40 years ago, I'm like, well, that's an old guy. Now I'm like, wow, that was a kid. That was just, he's, man, he was just starting out. Um, but this is what he wrote. And it was about this passage, one of the last things he wrote. He said, we are all beggars at God's table. We are not worthy to gather up the crumbs under that table, but nonetheless, God invites us to come and eat the morsels of the bread of heaven and drink from the cup of salvation. When we beg, God cannot help but take notice. The only problem is that we are too proud to beg. Maybe we should be as bold to ask, can I have your scraps? Now this is Martin Luther at the very end of his life, an amazing life. 
with a lot of trials, a lot of tribulations, a lot of opposition. But we're going to be insulted. We're going to have tests. But when we have and don't give up, keep on praying, keep on trusting. Don't be too proud to beg. And he'll reward your faith. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you that you do invite us to your table every day. And I pray, Lord, as, as we go through these various trials and tests, that we wouldn't waver in our faith, that we would be strong, because we know that you walk with us every step of the way, that we are your children. And you give us everything that we need. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.